It's time to announce the winners of the selfie contest. And to make the award, I'm inviting Lynn Dohm and Sasha Di Yamani to, to take the stage. participating in the selfie contest. It was lots of fun. As you can see, the fun photos that were taken, and I'm glad to see that everyone at High Tech was having a good time with it. We had over 65 submissions, so they're all posted on Facebook and on the Flickr site, and of course the sizzle reels. You can get those uh, links. I'll be posting them on Facebook and on the website as well. So now we're going to announce the winner. All right, everyone, before I announce the winner, can I have a drum roll? Come on, everybody. Ready, ready, ready? So we actually have two winners. Ready? So for a registration to High Tech 2015 in Portland, Oregon, we have Sandra Espayet and Angela Espanol. Congratulations uh, to the selfie winners. I'm sorry we didn't win, but to try again next year. Okay, um, my name is Gordon Snyder. I'm going to introduce our, our uh, keynote speaker, uh, Hillary Mason, um, who's sitting right here, is currently a, a data scientist in residence at a cell. But I just found out she started a new company last week, so. I don't know what the new, name of the new company is. <laughs> but before Excel, she spent four years as a chief scientist at Bitly. A lot of you use Bitly. I think everybody does here. Uh, for It's a URL shortener. Uh, where she's now scientist emeritus. And I can't believe you're emeritus anything. You're so young. <laughs> um, but she's at, at Bitly, she's still advising a team that studies attention on the internet in real time doing a mix of research, exploration, and engineering. She co-founded Hack New York, a nonprofit that helps talented engineering students find their way into the startup community of creative technologists in New York City. She's also a member of Mayor Bloomberg's Technology and Innovation Advisory Council. She's received a few honors this past year, including the Tech Fellows Engineering Leadership Award, and was on the Forbes 40 under 40 ones to watch list and Crane's New York 40 under 40 list. She's also been in Glamour Magazine, Fast Company, Scientific American, and many, and many more, which uh, according to her has made her mother very happy. <laughs> She's been a mentor, a strong advocate, and inspiration to women in STEM, which makes the parents of young women, um, including myself, uh, very happy to. And we know how busy you are, Hillary, and we really appreciate you being here at the conference. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, it's a real honor and really uh, awesome to be here and to be back. And um, it's not Gordon's fault he didn't know. I started a new company that we announced on Monday. 
so it's a, a brand new effort. Um, but, it, but it's fun to reflect on this because I started as a professor teaching computer science at Johnson Wales University. I realized that I was a terrible academic, um, became a startup engineer, ended up at Bitly, sort of uh, taking a, an academic approach to building software in a, a startup environment. Um, started some nonprofits, spent some time you know, building ridiculous technology on the side. Um, and then have found my way back to, uh, I spent a year with an investment firm, that's what Excel is, they're venture capitalists, they try and make new companies happen. Now I'm back to like actually building something new, so I'm pretty excited about it. Um, and if you do want to, well plenty of time for questions at the end, but also I'm H. Mason on Twitter, say hello. And uh, if you want to email me, I love email, hillary at fastforwardlabs.com. So I wanted to begin by saying please eat a lot of food. Um, it is really fun to speak to an audience of academics. I think it's the most challenging audience to talk to. Um, but I know your mouths are full, so at least I will get through this part. Um, before we get to the questions, don't be shy. Now to set the stage for what I'm going to talk about today, um, I just wanted to, to show you a little slice of the internet. So it's the year 2014. How many people in the room here are familiar with the website Reddit? Okay, I bet anyone who has teenagers has heard of it. Um, so Reddit is sort of like the armpit of the social media internet in the sense that, I mean that, that metaphorically, but um, it's a very free place. It is very free of modern etiquette. It is free of sort of, uh, you know, constraint. Some really awful things end up getting posted there. Some really wonderful things also. And I wanted to show you something that really stuck with me. So, so the website's really ugly. They don't have a large team working on it. Uh, somebody came along and asked this question. They said, if someone from the 1950s suddenly appeared today, what would be the hardest thing for us to explain to them about life today? And here's the answer. I possess a device in my pocket that is capable of accessing the entirety of information known to man. I use it to look at pictures of cats and get in arguments with strangers. <laughs> this is where technology has brought us in 2014 as a society. Um, and it is completely amazing. So what I'm going to talk about today is technology, um, but more than that, it's people and the people behind technology and how the two interplay and how they interact, both in the sense of how humanity and technology um, mediate each other, but also in the sense of, you know, who are the people we need in the future to build more of this, to get more cats on the internet, um, if that's where we want to go. And I wanted to start by showing you a couple of pictures. This is the first one. This is President Obama on the campaign trail. And I know the screens are small in this room, but what's remarkable about this photo is that every single person in the audience has a device. So if you look closely, you'll see that every single person has a camera, they have a phone, there's someone in there with a laptop computer, like open, like they're showing President Obama something. What this photo shows is that we are mediating our experience through our technology. And it's changing us as well. So this is a, a picture of a 12-year-old boy trying to pick a video game username. So at 12 years old, he's consciously aware of the social implications of his online identity. He's saying, you know, like, good names are things like the Dunkster and Zelda Conquer. And stupid names are bread boy, like don't be bread boy, right? <laughs> 12. And all of this human activity is generating more and more data. Um, we don't need to get into the numbers, but I think we're all aware that there's just more of it now than there ever has been before. And this has caused a huge uh, growth as well in the buzzwords we use to describe the data we have and the, the terms we use for working with it. So I wanted to spend a couple minutes just defining a few terms that uh, you probably hear quite a lot, at least I do. The first one being big data. You can ask how many people have heard this term. Many people. Um, great, so big data is what people talk about when they mean something that doesn't fit in Excel anymore. Um, 
Or if they're engineers, maybe they say it's something that requires a specialized infrastructure to compute on. You know, you can no longer load it into memory on your laptop and manipulate it. Um, as a particularly pedantic engineer, this definition doesn't work for me because what I can do on one machine has been changing every year as I get better machines. And so it's also a bad definition of what big means. Um, so I'm, I'm going to use the definition of big data that is a little more abstract and just say that big data is data made useful for making decisions. And by that I mean it's data where I have the infrastructure and tools to ask a question or a query that data and get the answer back before I forget why I asked that question in the first place. So again, big data as a technical improvement is really a human improvement. Um, and the size is not really relevant. So another term we use a lot is data scientists, and this one I actually like a lot. Um, data scientists are people who work with data. Um, here we are. <laughs> oh, data scientists do deserve their own title um, because they, they're not doing anything new. So the work that a data scientist does is work that has been done in a professional capacity for many, many years. Uh, it used to be called things like analyst or actuary. Um, but the technology has changed to allow that data scientist to do a combination of things that used to be separate professions. So data scientists combine three things. The first one is that ability to do math. When we say math, we mean a mix of statistics and perhaps linear algebra. Um, depending on the particular data scientist, their exp exposure to math might be quite different. Um, and that's fine. Most math that data scientists end up doing in their day-to-day -day work is actually um, college level math, but not much beyond that. The second thing they do is they, they engineer systems. So they need to be able to go into a technical workplace and have someone hand them a key to access a database and actually get the data they need out of it without messing up that database. That's actually not a non-trivial skill given the state of our infrastructure. They also need to be able to go to the whiteboard, build a mathematical model of something, write the code that implements that model, and then um, actually explain it to people. So programming is an important skill, though again, many data scientists are not professionally trained software engineers or programmers. And the last quality is by far the hardest one to find. It is that ability to ask really good questions and also to talk to someone who has a problem to go away and do an analysis with the data that's available and the technology that's available that actually tells you something about the world, to go back to that first person and explain to them what you learned so they can make a better decision. Um, that means they have to be able to communicate effectively, to articulate what they do understand and what they don't understand and what can't be understood, and to really understand what's important. So we have no greater insult in data science than to say that is an elegant solution to an irrelevant question. And this is not new. Um, this has been happening for a very long time. Um, there are just reasons that it's happening now. So we have cheap CPUs. We have, and th they're so cheap, in fact, that um, like I met a young woman at an event I did where I was talking about data scientists for uh, high school students who might want to be engineers or scientists. And she came up to me afterwards and she told me about her science fair project where she was using the Amazon Compute Cloud to sequence her DNA. And she was paying for it with her allowance money. And you know, it turns out she had a bit, a bit more of a generous allowance than I had, but um, <laughs> it was not that generous. Um, what's changed is not our, our capabilities in, as far as the technology, but the underlying economics and the tooling around it. So it's quite possible to go, to be on an airplane let's say, you know, flying home from where, to wherever you happen to live, to spin up a cluster of a thousand machines to analyze terabytes of data um, and to have that job finished by the time you land uh, and to do this for under 100 US dollars. Um, this is an amazing capability. But people always ask me where you can find the best data scientists and it turns out you find them in academia uh, and they're generally scientists of another sort who happen to have two of those three skills already. So maybe they're physicists, maybe they're geologists, maybe they're political scientists or economists, 
and they're not finding the satisfaction in their academic work, and so you can teach them that third category that they're missing and sort of put them straight to work. Lately, we've seen a ton of master's programs in data science. I've never actually met a data scientist who went to one of these because they're all so new, so I have no idea what their value is, but if you have one, I'd love to hear more about it. Um, and in particular, I'm really encouraged to see things like the program out of Johns Hopkins University, which is a MOOC and uh, peer counseling program, which is free or at a cost of a few hundred dollars, you can actually get a certificate. Um, because this allows people who don't have a traditional background to find their way to data science. And one of the most interesting things about this profession is that people do not come from only one background. Um, I have hired teams where people came from economics, physics, math, computer science, uh, political science, and art. And on teams, most companies these days are not just hiring one person to look after their data. They're trying to build a team of super Avengers, um, each of whom will bring some different skill to looking at that data set. But you might ask, OK, so you're talking a lot about data scientists in the abstract, and like, yes, they do math and code and whatever, but what are they actually doing? Um, and so a few examples, they are building dashboards. This is the most boring and by far the most common task that data scientists get when they go into a company. Um, this is a Google Analytics dashboard, but they almost all look like this. There are many things wrong with this design, and I'm happy to go off on that on another occasion. But um, what they do is essentially take data and make it accessible to other people. And it may not be time series data, it might be something like geographic data, this is something uh, the team at Bitly did where they looked at the influence of different media publications by state. And if you're from Wisconsin, The Onion is the most influential publication in your state and I love you. Um, and they might take it and make it real time. That's another thing that, uh, that we see happening. Um, but that's not the end of what data science really is. Um, and if you're a Dilbert fan, Dilbert loves to make fun of dashboards as a poor proxy for allowing people to make the bad business decisions they were going to make anyway. <laughs> but data science really does let you understand things in ways you couldn't before. So here are a few examples. This is um, a visualization of fast food burger restaurants around the United States. I know we have people in the room from all over the United States and beyond. But you can find where you live and you can probably figure out which color is which restaurant um, just by where you live and how frequently you see different restaurants. And this is from the OK Keep It blog. I'll ask how many people here have heard of OK Keep It. Not as many. Um, OK Keep It is a dating site that is very popular with people in their 20s. Um, they mine their data for all sorts of interesting stories, and I promise this was the most safe for work graph I could find on their website. But I really do advise you go take a look at it because uh, they have incredibly rich data. Their data set's tiny, and yet they come up with these amazingly interesting stories. Um, it's just a graph, right? Uh, here's an analysis some folks at Bitly did years ago where uh, we were trying to understand food as an identifying thing that ties all of humanity together. Um, I am from New York. These are the words people in New York were reading when they read about pizza. So, sliced cheese, it's cheap. For those of you who are not from New York, when you do go to New York, get a piece of pizza. All the pizza is New York pizza. You don't have to look for it. Um, and it shouldn't cost more than $2.50, and you can eat it walking down the street. It will make you very happy. Um, if you go to San Francisco, these are the words people read when they read articles about pizza on the internet. I have nothing kind to say. But if you go to Rome, this is what you'll find, and that looks delicious to me. But the point of these visualizations is that they are one-off visualizations designed to help you understand something about the world that you didn't understand before through the data. Um, and they are hopefully designed to be true to the data, which is another skill data scientists need to master, is to know when something is actually significant and how to convey that in a way that's beautiful and compelling, but also respectful to that truth. Now we're starting to see the emergence of a whole class of products we call data products because they are products that could not be built without really interesting data behind them. And this is the first one, and I will ask, this is the Google Maps live traffic view. What is the most remarkable thing about this data product?
It's live. It's boring, right? <laughs> it's really boring. And yet, when you actually start to think about how this thing works, it is absolutely mind-blowing, right? So Google has collected, analyzed, and forecasted an amazing amount of data in real time. And they are updating that as they look at the data from people's phones who have loaded Google Maps and see how fast they're actually traveling. And yet, any, anyone who has been raised to read maps can look at that and understand immediately which way they should drive. Uh, it's an amazing data product, and we take it completely for granted, um, but only possible because of that data. And another one that I love is called Dark Sky. It's an iOS app, but if you have an Android phone, there's a website called forecast.io. And what this team does is they take the public US government weather data source, and they've written an algorithm that takes your GPS location, so where you have to be standing right now, and they make a prediction about when it's going to rain. And they will actually buzz your phone and say, it is going to rain in 12 minutes where you are standing. <laughs> it is awesome. Probably unless you live in California, and then you don't care. But for the rest of us, really great product um, and only possible because of this data um, and another one I love is Foursquare where they've now built a product where you sit down in a restaurant and it pops up a tip saying by the way your friend Gary recommends you order this dish in this restaurant and there's a lot of interesting data here for the one thing knowing which venue you're actually in for example in this building you could be in four different restaurants but they've built really complex maps of the phone interference signals from each different venue to be able to figure out where you actually are and then to figure out which of the comments are actually valuable information versus not valuable information and then to figure out which one you actually want to see right at that moment it's a really cool data product also another new york company um, and one of my last examples is not a product really at all, except it's a, this is an article from Communications of the ACN. It's about a project where linguists and computer scientists collaborated. So the computer scientists built software that helped linguists deconstruct the ancestral languages of our modern spoken languages. And I found this amazing because it is boosting the capability of the human linguists in doing their work through data and through machine intelligence. Um, it is not replacing them. It is augmenting the abilities they have so they can do better work. And in this article is this wonderful quote saying, computation is the new handmaid of science. Um, computation as opposed to mathematics, which has been the handmaid of science for the last couple hundred years. Now this graph is from uh, the work of Sinan Aral, who's now at MIT, where he looked at susceptibility of influence by your relationship status on Facebook, and he was able to see that if you are single, you are moderately influenceable. If you're in a relationship, more so. If you're engaged, you're very influenceable. If you are married, no one can influence you. <laughs> All of his work is amazing, and I really recommend you look it up. And of course, if it's complicated, then like, who knows? Um, but this is a great example to highlight that we're starting to look at new frontiers in the way we do computational social science, the way we study humanity itself through our mediated data. And this is actually uh, causing controversy. About a month ago, Facebook published a study where they manipulated the emotional content of people's news feeds. Uh, to see if it left a positive or negative, if seeing more positive things in your newsfeed caused you to be more positive or the opposite, seeing more negative content made you more negative. And they found a very tiny statistical effect, but it caused a huge uproar um, because what happened is that Facebook is an advertising company and they manipulate you all the time in this manner to try and get you to click on and buy things. But social science research is social science research and has very different standards of etiquette, privacy, and expectations about how we work with patients or people. And the two collided uh, in a really interesting way. And so this conversation is still ongoing. It's one of the biggest issues we need to solve now. And the answer is not just that social scientists stop publishing what they learn, but still getting people to click on ads. The answer is that we find a way to do it that respects everybody. All right. But enough on that, I wanted to talk about technology. Um, so the tools that people in this field are building and using and what that kind of environment is like today, by far the most popular tool for data analytics is Hadoop. And can I ask if we have people in the room familiar with Hadoop? Not so many, so I'll tell you a fun little story. Um, the elephant logo is uh, 
Hadoop is named Hadoop because Hadoop was the name of Doug Cutting's son's pet elephant. Sorry, I touched something. Um, so it's really cute. And Hadoop is a great tool that allows you to write very simple MapReduce code effectively. It comes with a file system, lets you store data redundantly. Um, but the user experience of using it is still not that great. And so this is a real command line from one of my colleagues who was trying to figure out how to use the Hadoop install that was on his system, where he typed help and he got the like, maybe you mean dash dash help, and he typed you know, single dash help and said, maybe you meant help. And he, he typed help and he got a Java exception. And, <laughs> and then he wrote an angry blog post about it that I'm referring to in this talk. Um, we still have a lot of work to do to make these tools very accessible to people who don't enjoy getting screens full of this. Um, and fundamentally, what Hadoop allows you to do is to count things. And it is an exaggeration to say it does anything more. You end up writing a lot of code like this. Now, this is a Python script for counting things uh, using a MapReduce approach. If it were in Java, it would take me 20 slides just to show you the script, but it would do exactly the same thing. All it does is divide up the data, count things, and then add them back together and spit out the results so you can learn something like this. Um, but a lot of the process of doing this still involves chasing your, your tail around. So there are a lot of technical challenges in the field that need uh, a lot of good brain power to think through. And the first is to going from that static Hadoop MapReduce batch job environment to real-time systems where um, you are able to build algorithms that run and improve in real time. And the constraints there are very different than doing batch analysis. And a few of the big projects there are Spark and NSQ, things people are very excited about. The second one is that visualization and interpretation layer. So once you get that data back, you know, what do you do with it and how do you figure it out? And I mentioned I worked with an investment company for a year and I saw many, many, many companies pitching things that looked like this. I don't know what this means, but it's sort of like we have data, we add it up, and then we have a light bulb at the end. Um, most of their products actually look like this, and we still have a long way to go. And then building better product algorithms. Um, and by product algorithms, I mean things like recommendation systems. So if you go to Amazon and you look at Harry Potter, it says buy more Harry Potter. Um, as a, an aside, there's actually some really interesting information leakage in these recommendation systems. Like if you go look at a t test kit for THC, you can see what cleanses people are buying on Amazon. You learn something really interesting about humanity as a side effect of this recommendation algorithm. Um, these things are based on an algorithm family called collaborative filtering, but it doesn't always apply. So this is a, another New York company called Rent the Runway. For the women in the room, it is fancy dresses in the cloud. It is fantastic. You don't have to own them. They show up, you wear them, you mail it back. It's wonderful, but it turns out recommendation algorithms don't work so well here because the same dress you might wear to a birthday party is not the same dress you would wear to a wedding, and everybody knows that, but they've had to do some really interesting algorithmic engineering around that. And then things like uh, the work done at Netflix where it is rumored, seriously rumored, that they are studying user behavior to figure out what TV shows to create. Like which kinds of characters, what kinds of events, at which point does someone die, at which point does someone fall in love, uh, all algorithmic. It's pretty fascinating. So the last bit of this talk is actually not about technology but about people again. Uh, we still have a lot of work to do on culture. And uh, culture in startups as well. <laughs> so when we think of corporate culture, we tend to think of this. Um, and there's certain value to that. Um, the culture of data should be more like this. And I should have had a picture of data now that I think about it. But um, my friend DJ Patil likes to say that your, your data scientist is like your Spock on the bridge. Always there next to Kirk saying, here's the information we have, here's the best decision to make, but probably not the one in command. Um, if we do that more effectively, we end up with more of this. All right, so before I segue, I wanted to share this awesome cartoon, which is also that when we talk about data scientists, one of the critiques is that it's not really science, right? You're not doing experiments, you don't have a theory, you're not testing a hypothesis and then changing your experiment around again. You're actually not data scientists, you're data engineers. Um, and here, most mad scientists are actually bad engineers. They're not scientists at all, and I'm actually completely cool with that. 
So for the last bit of this talk, I'm gonna talk about startups, um, which are an area that a lot of people end up working in while having no preparation to work there. So um, most people go through school and they see a lot of big companies that have a recruitment apparatus and a pipeline set up. Um, and if they you know, apply for companies, for jobs, they do it through the systems that exist for that. And startups often exist slightly outside of those systems, largely because they can't afford to access those systems yet. And I was involved with creating Hack NY, which is a nonprofit in New York that essentially serves as a bridge between the educational community and the startup community. And my motivation for doing that was that I worked at a startup I love working with students. I think you can get a great job at a startup that offers way more um, career opportunities for the right kind of personality, but it's really hard to find them. And I started Hack and Why with two faculty members, one at Columbia and one at NYU, and they participated because their students would come in, study computer science, mathematics, or physics, and then the only job paths they saw ahead of them were finance and management consulting. Uh, and then they would come back five years later and say, why did I study computer science? I don't really like what I do for a living. And that is the saddest thing when you love what you do and you teach it to see someone who doesn't enjoy it because of where they've ended up. And so Hack and Why was a bridge between the two and said, hey students, maybe if you're not into finance, there are other jobs out there. You can go work at a startup and if the startup you're at fails after a year, that's cool, there are a hundred more behind them that are eager to hire you. And that worked out pretty well. Um, if you have students, you should encourage them to apply. It's a summer internship, and then many of them end up uh, accepting jobs at their, their intern companies. But startups also have some cultural problems, um, and that's what makes them fun, in that uh, it is an environment where people may be hired in for one job description and end up doing three others. Um, in fact, I had a, a coffee, was it Monday or Tuesday, with a young woman who was an intern on my team at Bitly, who went on to be hired as a full-time analytics engineer at a startup in New York. Uh, she's now the head of product. She's managing an outsourced engineering team. She's still doing the analytics. And she asked me if she should ask for a raise, and she's 20 years old. And <laughs> I don't know if I gave her good advice, but this is the kind of thing that can happen to you in a startup environment. I also did a project once where we looked at um, career data um, this was before LinkedIn was very popular, it was about six years ago, and we, we were asking questions like, uh, if you're a lawyer, um, you know, what, what's likely to happen to you in your career? And it turns out uh, half of lawyers are out of law in five years. But if you're an accountant, you're going to stay an accountant, like 98% of accountants were still accountants in five years. Um, but we were really curious about questions like, if I'm a, a programmer and I want to be a CEO, what's the best path to do that? It turns out the best path is to be a programmer at a startup, to start a startup, and then to um, you know, get credibility in a job you have no training and no reason to be good at, and then get that job somewhere else. <laughs> so startups offer lots of opportunities for, for people who um, are creative, resourceful, and interested in that. But they are a lot of luck. They are having a good product, a good technology, the right market opportunity, um, the right attention, from the media and the right people at hand at exactly the right moment, which means they go wrong most of the time. So when it works well, you've got a team of awesome, smart people, you're working on something you care about, and uh, you're gonna win, but sometimes you realize, actually, it did not work out so well. <laughs> so back to culture, we have a lot of things to fix uh, in technology broadly, but particularly in startups. This is actually a picture from a reality TV show called Startup Silicon Valley. This is, was actually on the TV show. I've met one of the people in this picture. Um, this was their portrayal of what it is to have a job in a startup. And for those of you who can't actually see the picture, they're standing around in silly costumes drinking beer. Um, I have never had a day of work like that. Um, maybe I've done something wrong. Uh, and then yesterday, Twitter released their diversity data, which is pretty shocking. Um, if you look at the second bar, in the technology job role, 90% of the people in those jobs are male, which seems like worse. That's horrible, right? And their racial diversity data isn't much better. And Twitter only released this data after Google led the way, and, uh, and Google did it because there was a young woman engineer out in California who said, this is bullshit that we don't even know this data about all of these technology companies and she got a bunch of startups to release their data on a GitHub repo and it actually had this huge effect in finally getting people to release these numbers. Now that we can see them, we can do something about it. 
<laughs> this was the cutest monkey of 2012 through Bitly data, so a lot of science went into finding that. Um, and I thought it was an appropriate place to conclude that part of the talk. Um, and just uh, a few notes. I always like to end on an optimistic note. I think there is uh, there is no more exciting field to be in than data and technology right now. Um, and there's also a huge need for people who want to work in this field. Um, companies cannot hire enough people. Uh, and people um, who work in the field are constantly given the opportunity to learn old things and learn new things. But what's coming next is really interesting. So I did mention I spent a year at a venture investment firm. And while I was there, I did really three things. So one was uh, help companies in the portfolio figure out what the heck they were doing with their data, which was a lot of fun. I have a lot of good stories from that. Um, the second thing was when someone applies for money or asks for an investment, uh, you know, sort of look at the technology and figure out if it's worth investing in. And for the most part, uh, it's very boring technology, but every so often you get someone who is either totally insane or a mad genius, and it's really cool. And then the last thing was spending time thinking about, you know, what do the next set of companies look like? Like, where's the big opportunity that's coming now? And uh, if we imagine the world we want to see in five years, what do those businesses look like? And they look a little bit like this. If you didn't see this movie, this is from her. It was really good. It was a really good movie because um, it was a science fiction movie that imagined what the future looked like with nothing blowing up at all. It was not an action movie. It was a, a love story of sorts. Um, you should watch it. But we're starting to see the ability to do things. Like, um, you know, some, sometimes I love my job, right? So, so there's a group at Google that wrote a really interesting deep learning paper on recognizing photos of cats. Um, I'm not making this up, it's research. We're starting to see the ability for machines to recognize fairly fuzzy concepts and rich media and to analyze them. We're starting to see machines that can write language that you can't distinguish from language written by a human being. We're starting to see very cheap hardware and software. So this is an ad from SparkFun, which is a company out of Colorado, where uh, each board on here costs at most $50. Most of them are around $10, and they're uh, open source hardware sensors you can build into data gathering devices cheaply. And so it's a pretty exciting time, and uh, there's a lot to figure out about uh, what we're going to do with it and who's going to do that. And so I will end here and say thank you very much. Uh, it really is a pleasure to be back here and to see everyone, so thanks for inviting me. Do we have time for questions? Yes, we do. Do we have any questions? Oh, so thank you. The question is, what's my new new adventure? New venture. Uh, the company is called Fast Forward Labs. It is an independent data technology research group in New York. Um, the problem that I saw is that most companies have no idea what the state of the art in data and technologies is like, and they would make very different business and product decisions if they did. And they have no in-house R&D anymore, and most of their money put towards innovation goes to nothing. Um, at the same time, there are a lot of folks doing really wonderful work on the academic side of the world, but are not encountering the problems that have a high value attached to them. So our group sort of sits in the middle, and we're working with uh, several companies already to be that bridge between the two groups. So thank you for asking. So the question is, how do we prepare students to learn about big data? And um, I mean, it depends on where they're starting from. But the way I like to approach that is to generally um, have students think about uh, open data. So I taught a class at NYU last year called Data Storytelling, uh, which was something, it was not in the computer science department, so it was in the media theory mix department with a mix of computer scientists and non-computer scientists. The idea was to have students study um, that process of taking a messy data set, finding something statistically significant in it, and then telling the story around it while, while respecting the truth of the data. Um, 
And to do that, I had them work with New York City open data. And every data set we looked at, we found something really interesting or disgusting. So I say disgusting because one of the, the open data sets is the restaurant inspection data set. Uh, <laughs> there is nothing more horrible than realizing your favorite place is like totally gross. Um, but I, I would have your students think, grab an open data set, and different governments around the US and even around the world are making them available. Sort of say, okay, what questions do we think this data could answer for us? And just start to explore it. And we even found things, like we looked at the, uh, the number of people crossing bridges into Manhattan um, by day. It was a very simple data set. It's just a count for each bridge every day. And we found this one week where the numbers were all crazy. And of course, our first thought was, wow, the New York City government is like, you know, censoring this data. Something's wrong. It turns out that week was Hurricane Sandy. And we learned something pretty interesting about how people responded to the hurricane just by plotting that data set. So I'd really encourage you to have your students explore it. If they're programmers, they're environments like R Studio or IPython that are open source, pretty easy to pick up. If they're not programmers, you can do all of this in Excel. But have them ask questions before they look at it, look at it, ask new questions, and then try to tell a story about what they've learned there. That's a pretty fun, fun way to do it. Please. was who influenced me. Um, that's a tough one. Um, I was very lucky to go to a school, um, an elementary school, that had computers and had very little supervision. Um, <laughs> and at the time I did that, so I'm 35, uh, you know, they were Apple IIe machines where you booted the thing up and you got a basic prompt. And what do you do with that prompt but figure out how to write commands and make it do something. And I fell in love with programming from the time I was very small. Um, but it, it, it's a good question. I've always had an encouraging family, even though they know nothing about technology or programming. They said, OK, you want a computer? We'll figure out how to get you one. Um, and I love games as well. So I, I think there's a lot of, of uh, possibility there. Um, I look today at games like Minecraft and the things that kids are building in that environment, and it's really exciting. Like that's a that's a game that is not a blow stuff up and go home kind of game. It's a game where you're thinking about a world you're creating, you're thinking about the rules of the world, and I see a lot of potential for that sort of thing to get that excitement out. Back here. What strategies would you suggest to kind of get the diversity that you were showing? So the question is, what strategies would I suggest to, um, to work on that diversity problem, and, uh, and how can we improve that? And that is a question I would really love to know the answer to, and I feel very unqualified to answer it, in that if I really knew why more women were not in computer science, I probably wouldn't be in computer science. Um, <laughs> that said, um, you know, I think about it quite a lot and try and do what I can to support programs that seem to intervene at the right moment. So I'm speaking next week at a program based in New York called Girls Who Code that take young women in middle school who are from um, like a very diverse set of backgrounds and give them a summer program where they actually make software. That seems pretty cool. Um, I like it because it's very empowering. It's saying, like, here, young woman, here's this power to do this thing. And whether she becomes a computer scientist or not doesn't matter if she has that with her for her whole career. Um, but solving that diversity problem at the startup company level is a little easier because there are pretty well understood techniques for, um, for working on it. One of them is that you have to look at uh, sources of bias that are not explicit. Like, it's very rare that someone actually comes up to you and says, you're a woman, so you can't do this. Um, it's much more implicit, quiet bias. It's a bunch of guys who are, are hiring for a position that they think they understand. They themselves, having been through maybe two job interviews in their whole career, are now interviewing other people. They have no training. Um, you know, it, it's sort of addressing those systematic problems. And then it's also identifying and encouraging people from diverse backgrounds to apply and participate. Uh, and so I try and do all of those things, though I, I don't think there's any one answer. And if there were, we'd, we'd do it. We have one more question over here. So 
Code.org estimates we're going to be a billion workers short in computer science between now and 2020. Do you have any ideas for how to accelerate your computer science workforce development, get more people involved, and get them done faster? You know, that's another great question. The question is, how do we, Code.org estimates a drastic shortage of computing professionals, and how do we accelerate that? You know, if we're in an economy where people majoring in business cannot get jobs when they graduate, and people majoring in computer, computer science get multiple offers for jobs, and that still doesn't shift the, the, uh, the talent, right? So I'm not sure that it's something that the market will fix. I think it's something we have to culturally fix. So we have to make it clear that a job in computer science is not a job as a drone in a cubicle solving someone else's creative problem. It is a you know, creative, empowering thing where you are building things, you're having a real impact on the world. And we have to show, uh, you know, just show people that that is possible, even if it's not, not the case for everyone. Um, and then I think a lot of it also comes back to the you know, mathematical and technical preparation people get uh, in their younger years and maybe making sure that that's a little more robust. All right, thank you. I think I'm the last before you can uh, go and take a nap for the afternoon. It was a good lunch. Uh, before I get started, I'm Kevin Cooper. I'm with the Nuclear Center, and I have the honor of being your chair next year to this, which is in Portland. Um, I did a little data science while she was talking. There is 582 people that signed up for this conference. And if you take five pounds, which is what each of you gained in Chicago, <laughs> and you multiply it, this room got 2,600 pounds heavier. So. <laughs> Good news about Portland is it's an awesome city like Chicago, and it's got great food, and it's got for the Portlanders and nor the whole Pacific Northwest. It's got great food and great beer. So, in a year from now, when every one of you is going to be there, it's going to be at, uh, um, five thousand pounds heavier. So, go go with that. Work out in between these two. But next next year, and the one thing I like about this conference a lot is. It's kind of by the people, for the people. We're talking about what we do to our colleagues and we're really doing amazing stuff. And so as you leave here today, I want every one of you to be an ambassador for this. Go back home and recruit for next year. Go back home and think about what you can present that's new and neat, data science, or, you know, I've seen a lot of stuff with those chip boards that people are talking about, those really cheap software boards that are being implemented in the classroom. Just really cool emerging technologies. Let's figure out what's cool and neat, bring it here next year, bring your industry here, bring students here, and let's make it even better in Portland, and please plan on coming. Before you leave, I was told to make sure you fill in your evaluation form and walk. Okay, that's all, thank you.